Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, one and all. Thanks for joining us in this edition of Practitioner Series. And today's topic for us is all about business simulations and experiential learning. So when I was on the lookout for understanding who would be the best person to actually talk about it, there's only one person who's got the, the longest pointing finger um, <laughs> and who's properly called the Gromit and has been there talking about service management and simulation games for 25 plus years and over three decades probably. So uh, I am absolutely thrilled to have Paul Wilkinson from Gaming Works join us today and share his insights about what is business simulations and his experience through this May. So welcome, Paul. Always a pleasure to meet you and have your perspectives in. How are you doing today? Happy New Year. I'm doing fine. Thanks for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to chat with you and brainstorm and share ideas. It's very inspirational. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I'm curious what it is you're going to ask me and, and what we're going to discover today. Yeah, so let us for our viewers about what's been your experience around um, the concept of what what made you to get into business simulations and games so give a bit of background of your overall experience and what made gaming works to get to this particular space you know okay um it goes back i think about 20 years 17 years or so since we've had gaming works i used to be an idle consultant and i had a head full of theory and i went into organizations and made a total mess of trying to apply itil and then I was also giving ITIL training. And I realized that ITIL training was hundreds of PowerPoint sheets with people giving you blank stares and with a total aim of passing an exam at the end of it. Then they would go back to their organizations and do exactly what I did as a consultant, be totally confused, not know how to apply ITIL. And then everybody would blame ITIL and wait for the next version to come along. So I thought there must be a more interesting way of making ITIL training more fun and giving people the chance to say, this is how it works. This is how you apply it in a safe environment. So I had that idea. And what happened was I was at a conference in America. I think it was a pink conference. And James Lovell, the astronaut of Apollo 13 was given a keynote speech. And everybody in the room was just staring, listening to this story. And as he was telling the story, I thought, well, that's incident management. That's change management. That's an emergency change. That's configuration management. That's capacity management. Everything I heard him say, I thought that's an idle process. And I could see how the room was reacting to this story. And I thought this would make a great case. So that gave us our idea to build Apollo 13, an ITSMF case experience, which we could then plug onto the back of ITIL training to help make it more fun, more enjoyable, and get people to translate the theory into practice. How do you prioritize incidents? How do you escalate? How do you track, record, monitor, escalate? How do you use service level agreements? So we built that game and then it just exploded and it went all over the world. Great, and in terms of what we are talking about here, Paul, uh, you talk about Kirkpatrick model, the learning model and outcomes. So just give us a bird's eye view of this Kirkpatrick model and how is it helping specifically on this business simulations. Um, that's, a, that's a good point, yeah. Kirkpatrick basically has got four levels of how you evaluate training. Now the lowest level is, is you, you evaluate the session itself. What did you think of the trainer? Was the coffee good? And we fill in the trainer told funny stories, the coffee sucked, the food was cold, the room was too hot. That's one way you evaluate the actual process itself. The next level up is you evaluate. Can we evaluate that we learned what we're supposed to learn? Now, this is where we're brilliant at in the ITIL world. There's more than 2 million ITIL certificates. We give people multiple choice questions to answer to say, yes, I've learned it. The next level up is where it starts getting tricky. Do we now actually see it happening in the workplace? Can we measure that people are now applying what they learned? Now, we asked more than 40,000 people worldwide, how many of you measure at this level? And it's less than 12%. So people come back from a training, they've got the certificate, 
but only 12% then say, okay, are you now able to use what you learned and apply it in your work? And the last level of Kirkpatrick is the level impact. Now, if you look at terms of ITIL, a definition of a service according to ITIL is value, outcomes, costs, and risks. And that's the same as a training. A training is a service you buy, which ultimately should change behavior, which should then either result in value, outcomes, costs, or risks. So that comes back to the question, why are you doing ITIL? Are you doing ITIL to improve customer satisfaction, speed up time to deploy, lower cost of ownership, increase availability? Why are you doing ITIL? And once again, often when people come into ITIL training and I ask them that, they've got no idea. So we try in a simulation to help people translate the theory into practice. And at the end of the day, capture concrete actions they want to take away and apply. And in the simulation, we show them, look, because you applied that, look what happened in the simulation. Lower cost of ownership, faster time to market, increased customer satisfaction. So if we applied that in this game environment to create that value, imagine what would happen if you took it away now in your own environment and did the same things. So that's how we actually integrate the, the Kirkpatrick level into making sure they know how to apply this stuff and making sure they know how to apply what makes a difference. And, and you've done this, um, you started off with ITIL with Apollo 13 and you have a lot of other games as well as part of the suite. So what are the core areas that you're focusing as gaming works when it comes to um, um, the management best practices or IT management frameworks? I guess we've got a, two prongs. One is we look for what are the most common best practices that people are currently adopting, because these represent trends and challenges that everybody's trying to solve. So we saw ITIL was the biggest growing one. At the time we developed this, project management was hot and project management failure was hot. And there's a lot of pressure around getting projects right. So we built the challenge of Egypt which can be used for PRINCE2 or PMI, it's a project management. After that, we realized that still this whole business IT alignment thing's not working. So then we built the Grab a Pizza, which is really based upon Domino's pizzas. How do you make a pizza company and turn it into a tech company that is rocking the share price and beating competitors left, right and center? So that was our business IT alignment game. Then what you saw happening was we got movements like DevOps coming along. So we built the Phoenix Project book game based upon the book, The Phoenix Project, because it was a world bestseller. And that's what triggered the need for DevOps. And our latest one is Mars Lander, which addresses the need now. Everybody's adopting agile, agile transformations, doing DevOps, and that's the Phoenix Project. And then they're suddenly hitting the wall of ITIL. ITIL gets in the way. ITIL slows everything down. Let's get rid of ITIL. So that's one of the reasons that ITIL 4 was developed. How do you make ITIL more aligned to DevOps Agile? And that's why we built the Mars Lander. It brings Agile, DevOps, ITIL all together in one game. And the great thing about each of the simulations is we as facilitators, as you know, because you're one of our master facilitators, we actually play the customer. So we play the chief executive officer or the mission director, and we know what value looks like. And we're challenging the teams to engage with us as business people, understand what value is all about, and then use whatever their best practice the game is related to, to try to demonstrate that. Excellent. And in terms of physical games, I know that when you started off uh, Gaming Works, we had a lot of games and, and I have a lot of boxes with my thing about all yeah. the boxes. Now, what do you think as being the difference? And with this pandemic coming in, a lot of people have gone remote. So one of the first questions would be, how do you shift your gears from being playing the physical facilitation of games towards uh, the digital format? Is that changing the whole dimension? And what's been the experience? You've played hundreds of games just for the Mars Lander. Uh, would be great to hear, because I always believe that the face-to-face -face conversations and, and interactions is so valuable, but now this is the new norm. So how do you help organizations to thrive in a digital and how has been the transition for gaming works from moving from physical to digital format that that was a real challenge because 
our whole business is classroom based games. And I remember the lockdown moment was something that March the 7th. And the week later, we were selling no games anywhere around the world. So our whole business fell apart, like many businesses. We were forced to adopt digital transformation, or whatever you want to call it, real quick. We had to develop online simulations without having any idea, any skills, any capabilities. So that's when we decided we need to put our games into the, the internet. So we built it on Mural. We built online games. Now, the interesting thing is the reason we did it is, A, we had to keep selling games. Otherwise, you're going to go bust. And B, we did it as well because people kept phoning us up saying, we're all working at home, but our teams don't know how to communicate or collaborate at home. They're used to face to face, looking at body language, seeing people, having that human interaction is what we do. A lot of our communication is that. Suddenly we're locked behind screens. Sometimes the video's turned off, but we still have to communicate. How do you make sure that people are actually listening? How do you make sure that we're all agreed what we think we just agreed? How do we actually manage and plan our work? So how can we actually visualize together in remote locations what we're all currently working on, which is why we built the games. So we use a visual board to show what each of the people in the game is working on. And these could be people from all around the world. They start to visualize their work. They start to focus on why can't you do this? Yeah, but I'm filled up. I don't have any more work. Well, I can't see that on the board that you're filled up. So suddenly they start to realize they've got to build a visual management capability that supports their problems. And every team's got different problems. So we use the online to help them build a real online collaboration tool. And the other thing which has really opened my eyes is how bad IT people are at communicating. We make so many assumptions. We say things and we think everybody's listened and everybody understood. Now in a classroom game, you often can see this because you can see somebody going, eh, what's he talking about? And they, oh, he obviously doesn't get it. When you're working collaboratively on a board or looking at things, you can't see people's faces and you don't know if they're listening. And what used to happen in the beginning was the team would make a decision then it would go horribly wrong. And we say, well, why did it go horribly wrong? Frank, why didn't you do what you were doing? Yeah, I didn't know we had agreed that. I went to the door to get the Amazon delivery guy. <laughs> so you suddenly realize that, wait a minute, we've got to make sure that everybody was actually there listening. Or somebody would suddenly say, sorry, my internet fell off for 10 minutes. And nobody knew it. But in the 10 minutes, they'd made lots of decisions and agreements. So teams started to learn, okay, when you make agreements, you've got to actively check. Okay, Suresh, are you aware what we've just agreed, what that means to you? Pete, do you now know what we just agreed? Did you know what it means to you? So we had to make sure you don't assume everybody knows. You've got to actively engage with them. Equally, when things are not working and people are trying to learn remote collaboration using remote tools. It's very frustrating. I hate it. I'm a technophobe. I hate using these things. And somebody's explaining to me how to use a tool and I'm going, it's not working. Why is it, why is it not working? I, I stop listening because the technology is now a barrier. And again, you've got to learn this working remotely. Does everybody know what they should be doing? They should be putting their hand up saying, hey, guys, stop a minute. I know you all understand the technique, but I don't. Can somebody help me? Managers don't like to admit they need help. Their managers and managers know what they're doing. But suddenly working remotely is something totally new we're not used to. And everybody's got fear, uncertainty and doubt. So that means we've got to create a safe environment where everybody feels free and open to admit they need help. Each of the team members checks on the other team members. Do you know what you're doing? Suresh, sure, can I help you? I can see you're struggling with this and make sure they're communicating. So it's really opened up working at home, how poor we are in active listening, communicating, agreeing, summarizing agreements. And that's one of the biggest reasons the games are used now, not just to learn ITIL or DevOps, but to help individual teams develop these types of soft skills as well. And one of the things I like about this whole simulation game is 
about the intake session, the, the whole simulation, how do you map those roles and also the debriefing. So help us understand how do you do the intake session? What's the purpose of the intake session? What do you do as part of the mapping of roles in terms yeah. of which roles to play and what is the debriefing? Because I think this is very unique that many of the training do not provide that level of uh, customization or tailoring of the needs of the business. So you have done this over and over again. So help us run through the intake, the, the, the flow in terms of how do you map the roles and also the debriefing aspect. Yep. Okay. Um, we use this thing called the eight field model, which takes you through the steps. On the right hand side of the eight field model, it's got the four levels of Kirkpatrick we just talked about. And the left hand side of the eight field model basically is broken down into what is the problem you're trying to solve? What are the behaviors that support that problem? The undesirable behaviors. What desirable behaviors you're trying to create? What skills and competences do you then need to solve that problem? And what learning intervention can you do to solve the problem? Now, normally people start at the level skills and competences. I want to send 200 people an ITIL training. Can you do it? Yes, we've got an online version and we guarantee pass rates. Oh, that sounds good. Give me one of those. Then we get 12 people in a room that's got no idea why they're there. So often I'll get people possibly phone me up and say, we hear you've got this Apollo 13 game. It sounds really cool. We want to run one. Tell us about it. And I usually say, I'm not telling you anything about my game. First, tell me why you invited me here. What problem do you think it's going to solve? Or if somebody's doing ITIL 4 training, here's a great question. Why are you doing ITIL 4? Tell me what problem you think ITIL 4 is going to solve that ITIL 3 didn't. People usually can't answer the question. It's usually, yes, but it's the latest version. We've got to get the latest certificate. Right. Shiny okay, new Okay, so toy. what do you want people to learn? Sorry? It's a shiny yeah. new toy. Let's get them board. Let's get, let's get the latest certificate. So usually I start with that. Why are you adopting this framework? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Yeah, we have to do that because um, we need a standardized way of working. Why? Well, we need it to be repeatable and consistent so everybody does it. Why? Well, what do you mean why? Well, if we don't, then we're going to make mistakes. So make mistakes then. Why well, is that a problem? Yeah, now you're being silly. If we make mistakes, we're going to lose money. Rework, customers get angry and say, ah, oh, for the first time, I've actually heard a problem. So getting back to the definition of a service according to ITIL, value, outcomes, costs, and risks. So why are you doing ITIL? One thing you just told me is we make mistakes that waste money, causes rework that waste time, and makes customers angry. Is that what you're doing ITIL for? Yeah, that's what I said. No, you didn't. You just said you want to send 200 people on ITIL foundation training. Just sending them to get the certificate, will they now come back and know how to solve lower cost of ownership, stock waste? Will they know? No, they'll just have a head full of 40 multiple choice questions and a certificate. So our intake forces clients to think, what is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the undesirable behavior that underpins that? People don't talk to each other. People don't ask the right questions. People don't communicate back to the customers. People don't test work properly. Okay, imagine now we've done this ITIL training and we're now six months further and I walk around your organization. What will I see people now doing? What will I see people doing? Well, you see people when they're given too much work, they'll say, why is this one first? They'll engage with the stakeholder if they can't meet the agreements. They'll phone them up and tell them. Okay, so that will help you solve customer satisfaction. Less mistakes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now I'll tell you what our game is. Then and only then will I explain what the game is and how we'll now take people through the game to create situations where they show the undesirable behavior. We then show the impact in the game on cost, revenue, everything they recognize. Right. Usually after the first game round, people say, why are we doing this? I could have stayed at work if I wanted to feel this pain. And that's what we're trying to create. Right. We try to create in the first game round a situation they recognize. Then we say, okay, how can we now change this? And what behaviors are we going to practice and experiment with in the next game round? And which bits of vital theory will help? So I explain this during the intake. What is the problem? What are the behaviors? This is what we're going to do. Then you ask, well, who are the stakeholders involved in the problem? 
So who do you need to be in the room to do this? Is it one team? Or if it's a problem between handover between engineering and DevOps, the mistakes are made because we don't communicate, maybe we should have them in the room. And maybe we should get them to switch roles, get the systems engineer to play the developer role and get the developer to play the systems engineer role so that they can understand from each other's perspective. Oh, now I understand why you do that. Now I understand why you keep asking those stupid questions all the time, because if you don't, things go wrong. So in the intake, this is what we try to do. But more importantly, in the intake, and it's not necessary to do with simulations. This is to do with any training. And this is my biggest bugbear of the whole industry. OK, you've got the ITIL certificate. How are you now going to embed the behaviours? What is your role as a manager now to make sure that that person has the opportunity to practice using it? What do you want to see them doing in the weeks after the ITIL training? What opportunity are you going to give them so that they can practice building a priority mechanism so that they can demonstrate to you their phone in the customer's back? What are you going to do to empower the people to start using it? Coach them, mentor them, give them time. And that's the same with our intake. We say at the end of the simulation, the team is going to capture so many actions they want to take away. They've now discovered how to use this. Hey, we need a priority mechanism. We need to do this. We need to actually talk to the business. They're so full of enthusiasm because they've now felt the benefits. They've got an action they want to take away. And if managers don't now enable and empower teams to transfer it to work, it's going to fail. And then during the intake, I say, if you're not prepared to commit management time to this, don't play the game. Because afterwards, people say, see, we told you managers weren't committed. We came up with a whole list of improvements, but they won't give us time, resources, energy to do anything about it, which is a waste of training budget. And unfortunately, a lot of ITIL training works the same way. We send people to get the certificate. They come back to work Monday morning and nothing changes. They don't know what they're supposed to use, what they're expected to learn, what they're expected to use. And then things don't change enough and people blame ITIL. See, we told you ITIL was no good. So when really, yet we just haven't transferred the learning. Right. In terms of, um, would you advise this uh, simulation games and gamification as part of separate learning or would it be have to be bundled with the training course? How do you think people are using this or how do you, would you, uh, what would be an effective way to deliver these workshops? Would it be a standalone one or should it be combined with an idle class or a DevOps class? What do you think has worked uh, with your clients? Yep. Well, there's, there's two ways of doing this. Um, sometimes people use the simulation straight away on the back of the foundation training. So they'll send 12 people to foundation training from different departments all over the place and then they do the game at the end. Translate theory into practice, take away individual actions. It's effective, but it's not as effective because these are 12 pe people from just different departments that happen to have time in the organization to do it. More effectively would be to say maybe, okay, send everybody on the foundation training. Now look at the problems you're trying to solve. Who are the stakeholders? Maybe you now need one developer one of the operators, a product owner, a security guy, people from a complete product line that is a problem, you may now, after the foundation training, want to put that team in a game. And that team then learns how to solve a real life end to end problem using the idle foundation theory, but to solve a real problem. So the most effective is really to use them as standalone with the selective right stakeholders you need to solve a problem. So right. I've seen it used both ways. Excellent. So the last one, uh, Paul, is that if someone wants to um, do the training program for a corporate, how do they get in touch with it? Who do you think should they approach? And um, what would be an opportunity for them to learn? Because they don't have a visibility. They want a facilitator to run through this. Um, and you guys are busy throughout. So what would be a best option for people to reach out for any of the games like the Mass Lander 
or the yeah. Phoenix project, um, both the, I mean, right now, let's speak online. Who, what yeah. would you use? What would be, what are the options for people to engage? Okay. Well, gamers, the, our model is we work with partners around the world. We've got a global partner network that use our games. And Suresh, you're one of our partners and master trainers. So you know about this. What we recommend clients do is, is try to think, what are you interested in first? Is it DevOps? Is that what you're trying to do? And are you interested in DevOps training and DevOps theory into practice? Then look for one of our partners that offers DevOps training and the simulation, because then you package both skills in one area. If you're just interested in maybe the soft skills, communication, collaboration, and that sort of stuff, but you don't want the DevOps, you just want the soft skills, then they can look for a training partner on our website that is a soft skills training partner that does organizational change, that does culture change. And again, if you're looking for BRM, look for a business relationship manager. Now I know Taub Solutions, I know you do DevOps and you do ITIL and you do BRM. So you do a lot of the best practice training and you equally plug the game in as part of your training. And I know that because you're a consulting club as well, you use the simulation as standalone consulting instruments. So customer organizations need to look at, do I just want to learn the theory, get the certificate and a bit of practice? Look for a training company. Do I want a consultant to come in and help teams actually make the change? Look for a consulting company that can play the game and help coach and embed the spin-off. And that's why we've got a global partner network of hundreds of partners. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Paul. I think this, this was very valuable for people to understand about the simulations, the gamification, and the opportunity for people to get engaged. Thank you so much for sharing your insights today. I hope uh, people will get to the load of the gamification, the business simulation, and uh, get to play one of the gaming work simulation in, uh, in, in, in sometime in near future. Thanks, Suresh. I'd just like to state in my pointy-fingered role now, mission director for Mars Lander, all of you people out there that are going on ITIL 4 training, come and demonstrate in a Mars Lander simulation, you can translate theory into practice and deliver value to my company. Do it in a safe environment before you go back to your company, get totally confused, get it wrong, upset everybody and create stress, frustration, wasted time and wasted money. So get in touch with Suresh, ask him to take you through one of these exercises and prove to me as mission director, you can translate theory into practice to deliver value. There you go, Suresh. Thanks, uh, Paul. I think it's always a pleasure to talk and we can talk for years, but so thank yeah. you so much. And I hope to see you soon um, in, in somewhere, somewhere in the conference. Thank you so much. I hope somewhere face to face before this all finishes. Thanks a lot for inviting me, Suresh. It was a pleasure. Thank you.